Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I thank the organizers for organizing and inviting. Um, it is uh, difficult, of course, in such times, but um, I think we are strong enough all together to make it a, a happy occasion. So I have the honor to, to start um, with a more pedagogical lecture. Um, and you have seen the title. Maybe I can try to repeat it here. So this is about aspects of transport. And um, it will be an introductory lecture in a way also because um, there will be subjects, questions formulated in this talk which will in fact only be answered in a more systematic way, in a more thorough way in, in the follow-up in the other lectures to come. Um, and in this case, that's why also for the introductory lecture, I will be speaking about, in fact, one specific setup, one specific model to be as concrete as possible and so to be able to open up, you know, like flowers and to uh, give rise to different types of colors and smells in the talks that will come afterwards. Now, um, let me still say some words about the title, so because there are adjectives that put it a bit better in the, in the context. I believe there was also the, here the word classical. So that means that I will not consider in these lectures quantum effects. Clearly, that is a great omission. Quantum transport and aspects of you know, mesoscopic physics related to quantum effects or of increasing importance with a, a lot of interest. Um, in fact, it's not completely true what I'm saying because the very model I will be using can somehow be also considered in some regime, which is called the Coulomb blockade regime, as dealing with some aspects of quantum transport. But I will not uh, dwell on that matter too much. So as I already said, the word, it is about mesoscopic, and mesoscopic places us between you know, these two worlds of the microscopic laws and the microscopic constituents of matter, and the more macroscopic, you know, hydrodynamic or macroscopic transport theory, which has to do with, you know, the differential equations that you know as uh, Fourier equation, Navier-Stokes equation, and what have you. So in the mesoscopic realm, I will be sitting in between, in a way, not quite microscopic, at least not for all degrees of freedom. And in that way, it will also be possible to speak about fluctuations and also necessarily about response. And in that sense, fluctuations and response will have their place also. Uh, which is, I believe, one of the main uh, crucial words of this uh, program. Maybe one more addition that uh, I have left open some space here, uh, which is that, just to make sure, it will be here about steady transport. And steady, I would like to just to add, so not to confuse you, because a lot of transport is intermittent or is transient, right? Uh, you can have that... Um, you have a closed, isolated system where there is an initial non-equilibrium, be it in energy or in temperature, be it in particle, and there is for a moment transport of mass or energy in the system. There is, an there is a transient current. This is not what I will be discussing here. Rather, I will be speaking about a current which is maintained in the time that we are looking at. So it also means, of course, that we are looking not only in a kind of energy length scale in the mesoscopic sense, but you should always keep in mind for the physics that they may also depend on certain time scales to so long as it is possible to maintain as so long as it is steady. All right, so what is the uh, coming, trying to be a little bit more specific already, what is somehow the main inspiration? I think the inspiration uh, is for everybody a bit different, and I hope you, each one of you has some favorite idea of uh, transport, uh, how it matters. But clearly there are uh, inspirations coming from, for example, biophysics, where you have the membrane of a cell. I will try to be very schematic here. And clearly you have all kinds of uh, pore structures, meaning, uh, let's say, little holes in the membrane, through which transport is possible, and which is, of course, very necessary for certain functioning and life processes. And that would be from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. 
and that can be, of course, via the so-called ion channels. These are called ion channels mostly, and different types of transport can happen there. For example, ions can be transported because of differences in chemical potential outside and inside. And these are to be regulated by all kinds of complicated processes. But this little channel that we have here, this ion channel, will be our uh, main area of uh, study. It will be there that we will be concentrating our attention. You know, the very system itself and the inside and the outside would be like reservoirs, right? But obviously there are other types of transport that you can imagine. The, the most simply is that, and now I'm talking about the macroscopic level maybe, if you have an iron bar and you put one type, one end into your bed, which is supposedly hot, and the other one you put in the, the bucket of champagne, which is still cold, then there will be an energy current going through that metal bar. Um, and it, you know how it will go. Uh, it will be following more or less Fourier's law, and there will be an energy going from the hot to the cold. And if you would not fill the champagne with ice uh, regularly, or you would get out of bed, it would, um, of course, equilibrate to equal temperatures. But as long as it is possible to remain steady, you will maintain this energy current. Now, what I wrote, what I somehow described here on a macroscopic level, in fact, somehow surprisingly remains valid to very small scales even. Even the Fourier law, this kind of phenomenology, macroscopic phenomenology, remains to a very great extent true all the way to nanoscales. But, okay, just to, to tell you that even on the mesoscopic scale, certainly there is room for such kind of boundary-driven transport, be it with, with uh, energy reservoirs, you know, different temperatures, or be it with um, different chemical potentials, like in this model that we have here for the, for the cell membrane. Of course, there are many, modern, many other models, um, too many to list here, you can have channels with fluids and differences of pressure and all that, pumps and what have you, to maintain a current. Okay, now um, there is one word in the title I have not been speaking about, and that is about what aspects really I'm interested in. And, and that's an important question. Uh, I mean, it's an important question because, you know, it, it tells you what is the ambition, what is the difficulty, and what you're interested in. And uh, in fact, we are interested, you know, we are only in the beginning of what is called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. We are really interested in elementary questions almost. So in all of these lectures, there will be almost no talk about things like critical phenomena, phase transition. Only in the last lecture, I will say something about pattern formation. But many things we are still trying to understand on an elementary level. And one of the things of these aspects that we would like to understand and maybe it will be a shock for you that I will spend some time trying to understand that, that is, how does the current flow? In what direction does it flow? Right? So what is the direction of the current? Now, of course, um, in your courses, books, textbooks, there is the rule of thumb, of course, that says, well, you just have to apply the second law of thermodynamics, it's a matter of having positive entropy production, and you know it will flow from hot to cold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you know also that there are many exceptions, and you can have interference of currents, you can have uphill diffusion, all kinds of strange phenomena. So we would like to understand it from a more fundamental point of view. What determines the direction of the current? So we will give you a specific model, we will discuss a specific model, and we will have not our, I mean, there will be no second law of thermodynamics hidden in my pockets. I will have to do it just with bare hands to show you what determines the direction of the current, and that hopefully will guide us to maybe even more complicated uh, problems. Then, uh, once we say direction of current, maybe I can immediately ask you, what is the probability of an error? You know, maybe it is in some context even possibly important to understand what is the probability that, quote unquote, things go wrong, that flow you get in the other direction, that would be a fluctuation. So what's the probability of a fluctuation? Can you say something about such probabilities of an error? And by error, I do not mean something which is fundamentally wrong, but something which is driven by fluctuations, obviously. And we would like to have quantitative estimates or comparison estimates, how to understand that. 
Okay, so there are uh, other aspects that I will even touch in this lecture. And one last thing that I will touch is, you know, um, clearly, as I was speaking, this maintained current, it depends on all kinds of parameters, right? First of all, it depends on the reservoirs, chemical potentials, temperatures of the reservoirs, and maybe other things. And the maybe other things will be very important because what we would like to understand also is what will happen to the current when we change situations? By situations, I mean the easiest one would be what if we change the chemical potential left or right? Okay, or, or what happens if we change uh, one part uh, of the entrance of the, of the membrane? You know, this is all gated and in complicated ways. Or suppose instead of champagne, we use wine. I mean, white wine then. Or, or, or we, okay, I will not speak about the bed, but somehow you understand that there are many parameters that possibly in our dreams could influence the current. Do they and how? So that's related to another major topic that you want to discuss in, in all of science, basically, and it has to do with response. What is the response of the system to an external stimulus. I mean, this is not only physics, right? This is biology, this is chemistry, this is psychology, this is sociology. And very often when you go out of equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, you get more and more inter interdisciplinary applications which are relevant to understand in this context. Now, I will not do difficult things at all, but I think that in easy systems, we can learn a lot to see what is involved. So these are the aspects that I will Hopefully, if I can start, um, I'm speaking too much already, that I will be discussing in this talk, but with many open ends that um, will follow in the talks to come. All right? So before I really, really, really start, let me, um, let me still tell you to make sure that if there is a question or a remark or anything, a comment, uh, please do not hesitate to just, you know, Tell me no, or I mean, just if you have a question, do not hesitate to ask me, right? I mean, so in that way, a bit of interaction may also help to make it more digestible for everybody. Okay, but um, I think we are a small group, so we, we can interact and speak about the things that we, that we like. Fine, so after this uh, very general introduction, let me then start with the model, and I will start with the model in equilibrium. So. Note that I have already used the words non-equilibrium and equilibrium, and I will not try to give you general definitions for the moment of what is equilibrium and non-equilibrium. I will just do it via this example and not try to be very general for the moment. So what is the setup really that we are talking about? So it will be very simple. I will speak about a channel indeed, which is a one-dimensional lattice interval. So there will be sides really, it will not be the continuum. I will make my life very easy. There is a first side one and this, there will be L sides, so like the spatial size is L. And I will denote a general side say with I, and there will be then an I minus one and an I plus one as nearest neighbor, right? Okay, so there are a number of things that um, we need to set up here, namely what are the dynamical variables, right? So to every side there is assigned a occupation, I will denote it by eta i, is it big enough for everybody? I mean, can you read it? I will try to keep capital letters like that. I hope you can read, if you can't, tell me. So the eta i, as I said, is an occupation. So this takes two values, which is vacant or occupied. And you can think indeed of a particle being there at that site or not being there. Maybe if you have wilder dreams, you can also think of an energy packet and maybe a, you know, a photon or something, but this I will not use for the moment. Just think about a particle being there or not being there. And then, of course, if we speak about the configuration, we will in general denote by eta the set of all these configuration of all these occupations in this lattice interval. So if you tell me for every side which one is occupied and vacant as a configuration, in a way, well, not in a way, exactly, you understand that we are speaking about indistinguishable particles here. 
right? Because I only look whether the site is occupied or not. So to, for these indistinguishable particles, eta, the configuration, I can, um, I can speak about certain variables that we know since childhood. And these variables are things like the energy associated to this configuration eta. And obviously, there is also the number of particles associated to eta. That's maybe the easiest one to start with. The number of particles eta, that's just the sum of the eta i's, obviously, going from 1 to L. We can also speak about the number of particles, say, in a lattice interval going from i to k. And that would be the sum of particles, say, between i and k minus 1 or k, I don't know. OK? Maybe also k if I include k. So that would be the number of particles in that lattice interval. That's all very clear. Now, the energy, that is not something that uh, follows directly from the configuration, right? You need a bit of, you know, it depends on the interaction, as we say. So there is already some interaction that I have not even mentioned, spoken about, but which is kind of clear what happens here. Because if there is any dynamics to come, it must be taking into account that there can only be one particle per side. So there is an exclusion, right? This exclusion can have many origins. It, can, it may be that simply, you know, that you're a car in a narrow road. Can be that you're an ion in a small channel. So there is a kind of exclu exclusion that you can have only one particle per side. That is a first interaction. But then additionally to that, it can be that you like to have neighbors or you can repel them or all kinds of things. So in general, in fact, you can have many things. And let me give you an example of what, of what you could have. And this example um, is important and not important. Let me explain how. So I take just the sum of the eta i's, which is the number of particles multiplied with some constant b. And then I have some interaction, which is nearest neighbor, eta i, eta i plus 1, going from 1 to L minus 1. OK? Now, there are two parameters, which is nice always. You know, think, I mean, if you're used to models in equilibrium, statistical mechanics, think about the easing model. You have like a magnetic field and a ferromagnetic coupling. Well, here you have something similar. You have a B, which is related to possibly adding something more than, you know, some attraction to the ions, to the, to the particular uh, sides that you have, possibly. And you can have an interaction, and this kappa can be positive or negative, as you wish, you know, depending on whether you want to repel or attract particles. That's a particular uh, energy. Now, I told you that um, it, is, it matters. Of course, it matters a great deal for what is going to come. But in a way, we would like that this discussion here, you know, the yellow discussion, we would like that this is not anecdotal. We would like to give arguments that supersede these kind of very specific things. Now, it's always nice to have something simple and to check things, but then have arguments which are a bit broader. And that's what we want. At the same time, you know, there, is, there will be somehow something of a miracle will happen. Let me announce you the miracle. Usually, and the miracles are not announced, right? But here is the announcement of a miracle. I told you that I will do this with bare hands, right? So with no thermodynamic principles. But in fact, there is something which will be hidden all the time from our eyes. And that thing that will be hidden, not at this section one, but at section two, is that, you know, you can imagine that the typical configuration of ETAs in these channels, what is the statistics of it, will be too complicated for us to know. Right? Maybe if the, the B and the kappa were zero, so the, there is kind of no energy related except exclusion, then perhaps we can know the stationary distribution. I'm already using the word stationary distribution to refer to like a stationary statistics of the occupation. But in general, we will not know the stationary distribution. So the miracle I would like to announce is that even though I want to make things a bit complicated by being general in energies, I will, for every one of these choices of B and kappa and maybe other energies, I will be able to answer these questions. So I will need tricks, right? I will have to circumvent the ignorance we have of the configuration statistics. We will have to circumvent that to get to the answers.
So that's another announcement. Okay, so um, what, uh, what do we mean by here with equilibrium? Well, let us, let us take two stages, perhaps. Um, the first thing that can happen is that this system, let me draw it again schematically from 1 to L here, is surrounded by a big reservoir which is at a certain temperature T, okay? Uh, which is, you know, uh, an equilibrium reservoir. And the only thing that happens that you can imagine is that there is uh, energy exchanges with this reservoir. Okay, there is an energy related to these particles, and there may be exchanges of energy between the system and the rest of the bigger system. So this is the whole universe, maybe, which is at the temperature T. So that would be a first case. And then you can imagine, I'm not even speaking yet about the specific dynamics, but you can imagine that you have energy exchanges, and let me denote them by eta, eta prime. And just imagine that we have a change from a configuration eta to eta prime. Well, then we know, of course, the change of energy in the system, but the change of the energy in the reservoir will be minus that change, right? So we imagine, even though we will rarely speak about the details of this reservoir, we imagine that the change in energy in the rest of the world is minus the change of energy in the system. That is not a completely innocent remark because it requires, for example, that we exactly know what we mean by energy of the system and energy of the outside. You know, there is always a coupling and how you cut exactly the system out of the total universe, that's not something which is standard given. So there is an additional assumption under which we will always be working in this kind of modeling and that is sometimes called a weak coupling assumption. And in fact, this weak coupling assumption will be silently present in many cases. So it will be present in the sense of that we all know what we mean by energy of the system, but it will always be present in the sense that the reservoir in our schemes, and also when we have two reservoirs, they will be present, they will have a representative, which is basically thermodynamic equilibrium parameters like temperature, chemical potentials, etc. Okay, so I will not go into the details of that, which is a very important question, of course, and it is the question of reduced description. You know, you start with a Hamiltonian system for a big system, and you would like to understand the open system dynamics for a subsystem. That's an important question that goes under the name as weak coupling limit, Van Hove coupling limit, and all kinds of limits that you can take, and I do not speak about them. All right, so what is the change of energy in the reservoir? Well, the change of reservoir energy would then be just E of eta minus E of eta prime, of course. So that is the change of energy when you go from a configuration eta to eta prime. Sorry? The yes, yes, yes. So for the moment, there is just energy exchange. That's correct, yes. And associated to this energy change, there is also a change in entropy of the reservoir, which is just one over the temperature, E of eta minus E of eta prime. Okay, so here I'm using, I mean, I'm using the closest formula for entropy. It's the change of entropy in the reservoir, like the equilibrium change, because I have a change of, I dissipate energy, I, give a, for, I have a transition from eta to eta prime in my system. It gives rise to a change of energy in the reservoir, divided by this temperature, it's the, um, the, the change of entropy in the reservoir, yes. This is thermodynamic input, absolutely. So I will not... Yeah, yeah, that's true. I was exaggerating, I think. Okay. So that is the change of entry. It's, it's uh, I mean, let's see how I use it, right? So maybe um, I take the opportunity to write something here. And this is the first thing I write here. This is close use. That is what this is the basically referring to the the first part of the closure theorem in 1865, the definition of entropy. So I assume indeed that this, under this weak coupling regime, everything is much faster in the reservoir than in the system. And if I have a change in the system, it gives rise to a change in energy, which directly equals the entropy that is given in the reservoir. Okay, so these are all assumptions somehow, but they are 
not such a bad assumption if a reservoir is really a reservoir. Okay, now, um, there is, now another thing I would like to do is, um, you know, so far I have not been speaking about dynamics in, except that I have said, well, we can imagine transitions between eta and eta prime. But suppose we really want to set up a more specific open system dynamics for that system. Well, again, for the fourth, fifth, sixth time, I have to say that doesn't come uh, for free, right? This is a very complicated thing because all we have in the world is, you know, the Schrodinger equation maybe or the, or the Hamiltonian, Newton's equations for the whole universe. The etas here are more like quantum particles, but okay, make, don't, don't worry too much about that. But in the end, we would like to understand the induced dynamics on that subsystem. Now, that's a very, very complicated system question, right? Now, we could, of course, immediately give you, I could immediately give you the model. I'm not going to do that. I would like to understand whether there are principles that will somehow have to be obeyed. And one of the main basic principles that have to be obeyed is that we do not break time reversal invariance, right? So if we say that the whole universe here represented in this, in this apple is, a, is time reversal invariant, Hamiltonian dynamics, that would have an influence. So how do that have an influence? So this time reversal invariance leads to the fact that whatever dynamics you have in your system, whatever it has, as complicated as it may be, it has to satisfy something which has become known as the condition of detail balance, also called sometimes microscopic reversibility. Where does that come from? Well, let us just assume, uh, indeed, let us just write that, I mean, I will try to explain what I mean by probability, but let me first say it. Suppose we have a sequence of configuration. So I have an eta 1 going into an eta 2 and maybe finally going into an eta n. It's continuous time, but maybe I look at stroboscopically and I see that I have a trajectory where I pass through these various configurations. Okay? Now, time reversal invariance means that the probability is just the same as this one. Namely, you just reverse the trajectory. Right? So this corresponds to um, some things like, okay, let me open a window here. Suppose I have a, um, a room with gas, and suppose that I ask what's the probability that at time one I have particles sitting mostly at the left of my box, and at time two or at time later, I have them spread out uniformly over my box. Well, what I'm saying is that the probability of having first this and then that is the same as the probabilities in the second scenario where I start with a basically uniform distribution and I go after the same amount of time to a situation where I have this configuration. Is that clear? I mean, you may be at first a bit a bit wondering, I mean, you would think that the probability of going from here, uniform distribution to like a very specific concentration of particles that this is very unlikely in your experience, that's true, but that is as unlikely, right, to find this. So the probability to go from here to here is very small indeed, but it is as small as it is the probability to have that in the beginning, right? So that's why you, uh, but it is required by general time reversal and variance that these have the same probability. What do I mean by probability? I mean, I speak here about probability even for closed um, mechanical isolated systems. It's all deterministic dynamics. So what do we mean by probability? Again, let me not dwell too long on that. But clearly, we are not looking here, if I make my drawings, we are not looking here at the minutest details of the microscopic configuration, right? We have a microcanonical ensemble, probably, for all my particles, which basically means that on the energy surface, all possibilities of positions and velocities are equally probable. And that microcanonical ensemble induces probability on all kinds of reduced variables, right? 
So do you get probabilities on the more coarse grain description? So here is the same. Probably I have something very complicated in my universe, and then I can speak about the probability of a more coarse grain thing because I only look at the etas, right? So back to where we were. I was saying there is time reversal invariance, which expresses this thing. So this is an equilibrium statement. Maybe I will add here the subscript equilibrium. And that will lead to the fact that you have a, a, a detailed balance. Now, how, we, how is the, the thing you, you probably re know it best? Well, <laughs> this is the last time I will mention that. <laughs> I mention it too often. You know, under conditions of coupling between the system and the reservoir, and if it is very fast and weak coupling, we can show actually that this reduced dynamics here will be a Markov process. It will be a Markov jump process. I mean, basically, things, arguments related to the F Dirac Fermi golden rule will do that. Born Oppenheimer approximation von Hovey coupling limit. I'm just shouting some names at you. But there is a whole theory and a lot of effort in trying to understand that. But if you take it for granted, you will get that, in fact, this sequences, the probability of sequences are just determined by the probabilities of going between two in one step. So you really want to say that the probability of eta 1, first eta 1, then eta 2, is the probability of eta 2, then eta 1 in equilibrium, which in the Markov context just means that I have an equilibrium probability to finding an eta 1, then I have a rate of going from eta 1 to eta 2, and that must equal the probability in equilibrium to have eta 2, and then the transition rate of eta 2 to eta 1. And that's called the condition of detailed balance. And it was, it was understood uh, by people long ago, in particular, particular by people like Onsager, uh, Lars Onsager, how indeed such detailed balance is related to time reversal invariance of the underlying microscopic level. But here on the mesoscopic level, we get this in terms of a detailed balance condition. Okay, so in other words, the only thing you require is that this equality is valid. So whatever you do with your Markov dynamics, whatever rates you take, there are many, many choices, a zillion, but it has to satisfy that, where these probabilities are, well, in our setup that we chose to have a canonical description of equilibrium, just means that the probability in equilibrium of such an eta is e minus beta e. Right? Just the equilibrium canonical distribution. And then the k just have to satisfy the ratio between an eta prime and an eta. So when I speak about here this transition, the transition rates must satisfy um, Right? That's the only condition that we have for the transition rates in equilibrium. So as Anupam was pointing out, basically in equilibrium, we can make the dynamics to a big extent already by just thermodynamic considerations. We don't need anything else. Uh, and, and, and you get the stationary distribution, which is just determined by the energy and basically the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy here, right? Okay, now um, let me immediately add the second step, maybe I hope a bit faster, so I will not go into all the subtleties and, and complications, but I will now leave and be more pragmatic. And I will immediately add that, obviously, I can change this picture a little bit and have... Uh, it uh, in a bit different way. So let me change my picture locally here. And let me draw it like that. And now we imagine again that the whole world is at the same temperature still. My whole universe is at the same temperature still. But I also, uh, and, and possibly I have, okay, for temperature, there is everywhere the transitions at equal temperature. But there is also here a chemical potential, mu, 
which is left and right the same and will, will enable to have exchange of particles. So no particles will be able to be exchanged with the universe. And I choose in this model to be boundary driven, you know, like in these models. Well, it's not driven yet because it's the same chemical potential that you have particles jumping in and out. Now, um, what has to change here in all of that? Well, not so much, right? I will just do the same thing, but uh, a little bit faster now. I will just add that I also have um, in the transition from eta to eta prime, I have a change of particle number in my reservoir. So there will be a change of particle number in my reservoir, and clearly that is eta prime, the number of particles and the number of particles originally. That's the change of particles in my reservoir. And then the change, I again use closures basically, to add here minus mu over t, the number of particles um, minus the number, uh, eta minus eta prime, I guess. Sorry, sorry, this is different, no? Like that. All right, so I just add that. That is coming with the change of entropy. And now I just do the same thing as I did here. But now the equilibrium is in the grand canonical ensemble, right? So instead of this canonical thing, I just have here mu of n eta. I just add this in the weight of my ensemble. And instead of the Helmholtz free energy, I have this grand canonical partition function that I use to normalize. But I have the same structure. And now what do I have to write here? Well, I have to make sure that I have still detailed balance. So the requirement is that the ratio of the rates is, the is, is basically the ratio of the probabilities. But I will write it different for you. If, of course, it will be as correct. But I will write it in a different way to let something speak to you. Namely, I will write it uh, as follows. I will write it like the exponential of s eta eta prime per kb where um, brr, 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 um, uh, yes so I have to put here a delta where this delta s is just sitting here I hope I didn't make an error with a minus sign somewhere but so if you just do what I said you impose the uh, detailed balance the, you do the algorithm I just said, then the result is that you find that the ratio of these transition rates is the exponential of the change of entropy in the reservoir divided by Kb, Boltzmann's constant. So it's the entropy flux that you get in the transition from eta to eta prime. So why do I want to say that in terms of entropy and not in terms of n? Because it's mathematically just the same. Because we will need that later, that understanding. And of course, it's a, an understanding that also goes back to Onsager, um, which, which basically tells us that the weight of a, of a configuration, of a macroscopic configuration, is related to the entropy, right? I mean, this goes back maybe to Boltzmann even, where, or to Boltzmann-Einstein kind of papers, you know, this formula where W, the Wahrscheinlichkeit, the, the, the probability, is the exponential of the entropy, right? So this is the type of thing that I am using here. Well, that, that not, I'm not imposing it, it just comes out like that. Okay, maybe it's time to add here also some other names uh, that I will speak about later. So Boltzmann I mentioned and Onsager. Okay. So for the moment, uh, that is the setup about equilibrium. I didn't even say much about specific rates. I just say in equilibrium, if you have that, you will, I mean, you will go to, you will relax to the equilibrium distribution, etc. I'm not showing that, but I would like to mention a couple of other things which are not mentioned very often, and maybe you may want to hear that. Okay, so here are a couple of things that I would like to add to the equilibrium description. So that is 
the blackboard so far that we got with some definitions of energy, particle number changes and entropy. Let me erase these beginnings here. All right, so there are a number of details, maybe, little things that I wanted to add because they will be useful in the coming lectures. So the first thing that um, I wanted to remark, so there are three remarks I want to add, all to related to the situation in equilibrium. First remark is that, you know, there was a parameter kappa in the energy. You remember the coupling, right? No. Um, here is a little thing that you may want to check. Suppose I take this energy, which is a function of eta, right? But it's also a function of kappa. So let me take the derivative with respect to this kappa. It's just seeing how the energy changes as a function of kappa. And let me take the average of that in the equilibrium ensemble, like we have it uh, here. These are the canonical or the grand canonical ensemble. Let, let's take the canonical ensemble even, just looking at the canonical ensemble. Then, in fact, there is something that is happening. Namely, you can write this as the derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to kappa. So where F is minus kBT, the logarithm, you remember, of Z, which is the partition function related to the canonical ensemble. This is just an exercise in just taking derivatives and taking integrals. But you see this happening that, um, of course, these averages here, these brackets are averages, right? They are averages. Maybe I should write it down for once. So these are the sum over all the possible etas, 1 over z. Then you have the e minus beta e of eta times d e d kappa as a function of eta. So that is what I mean by this average, right? Where z here, z, that's the same z as here. And maybe you remember from equilibrium statistical mechanics that the Helmholtz free energy gets a meaning by taking the logarithm of that partition function. And that's an important uh, relation. Why is that? Because you see how, you know, taking derivative of an energy with respect to a parameter is like a mechanical potential. It's like a mechanical force you're introducing, right? If I would write here, uh, if I would write here a minus sign, it would be like writing, you know, the derivative of the Hamiltonian or something with respect to a parameter that would be like a force that I'm calculating. So you take a mean force, and the mean force is in fact a force derived from the free energy. So the term dynamic free energy, where it, it has appeared everywhere there, also happens to be a force. It happens to be a potential giving rise to a force. We will come back to that in lecture five, to this remark, because this has to do with forces. You know, entropy is, uh, is a thermodynamic thing, but it gives rise to real forces. Think about elasticity, maybe the simplest example, but so these, these thermodynamic potentials give rise to forces. Second remark, um, so this will be lecture five, I think. Second remark is maybe lecture uh, three or four. In equilibrium, you can, well, you can always ask the question, even in equilibrium, you can ask the question, what's the probability that the number of particles is about equal to the, some density, L, so rho. So, you know, the number of particles per unit length is equal to rho. I mean, this, this little wiggle here at the equality just means that don't take it too serious, that it has to be exactly equal. Maybe you have some tolerance, but that is more in the sense of mathematical notation that it will sophisticate the matter a bit. But clearly, that's a, a question about what is called large deviations. What's the probability of really a big fluctuation? Because we do not say that this rho is the equilibrium density. It could be an, another one. Right, so you expect, in fact, don't you, that somehow at, if you have a gas away from phase transitions, you expect that this is exceedingly small, no? Here in this room, 
uh, we have a certain density, right? And, um, you know, deviations from that are very, very small. It, it, if you, a, a drop of rain that would follow here would be a bit strange, no? And in fact, it is, um, you would think that it is very small by orders of L. So if L goes larger, to have a strange density in all of L, it would be exponentially small in L. So since long, these pioneers of statistical mechanics have asked people like Boltzmann and Einstein and others, Planck, have asked, what's this probability? And there was again something very nice happening, namely these free energies do not only happen to be forces, these free energies do not only happen to appear, well, basically in the dynamics, how you do make the dynamics, but it turns out that they also have a meaning in fluctuations. So free energy, you know, free energy is related to work. Isothermal, reversible work is given by the change in free energy, right? But these people understood that this probability is in fact given by differences in free energy. So I do not know these formulas, but something like that. Um, uh, maybe I should copy them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, be specific. I will not derive that, no. I just wanted to give this as a detailed, as a remark. So where the, uh, where the, where the F of rho, and mu, okay, uh, okay, so I will write this as omega mu rho, and um, this omega mu rho is equal to f of rho minus mu of rho, where f of rho is the canonical one, so it's like minus kbt per L logarithm. And the omega mu is minus kbt over L, the logarithm of the grand canonical partition function. Okay, I mean, I think this is so important, this formula, that I, I think even though it takes me time from my main subject, it is good as an introduction to lecture three or four. Why is it so important? Because of this, what I already said. You get a probability, a large fluctuation expressed in terms of free energies. And, and what are the free energies? First of all, omega mu is the grand canonical free energy. So, sorry? Densities, yes. So I have to divide by L everywhere. So they are densities, of course. So and I have, in fact, this is true in the limit L goes to infinity. Okay, I didn't say that. I should have said that. So this is, the omega mu is just a cano grand canonical free energy. And this is uh, a kind of thing that depends on rho by a kind of Legendre transform, doesn't matter, with respect to the Helmholtz free energy, conditioned on the number of particles. Now, you see that um, when it happens that the rho is the equilibrium rho, that is zero. And otherwise, this is positive. I mean, this is, I will not prove that, but again, it gives you the variational principle in thermodynamics saying that the equilibrium condition will be such as to minimize the free energy. Okay, so that is such an important principle. I mean, somehow the basis, I mean, this large deviation theory is somehow the basis of equilibrium understanding of thermodynamics that we will have to visit it in lectures three and four and see what remains of that in non-equilibrium, right? Because that gives you all of, that gives you the beginning somehow of the, of the understanding of thermodynamics. Okay, so these were two remarks I wanted to add to that, um, except that maybe, as I'm losing my time here uh, by my remarks, let me still have a remark number three. Yes. The, the, this one is the grand canonical one, and, uh, and that's, yeah, that's the grand canonical. This is canonical because I'm fixing the density here, right? Sorry? Yes, yes, that's nice, thank you. Yes, uh, I mean, if this is not completely clear now, I promise that I, well, 
I will uh, uh, be more elaborated in um, lectures three and four. Okay, the, so uh, there is another one which goes to lecture two. Suppose I'm asking you for the average number of particles in equilibrium. Okay, so we know this is what we call the equilibrium density, right? But clearly, this equilibrium density depends on the chemical potential. Right? If I have a higher chemical potential outside, I will have a higher density. So you can ask, even though in the notation I did not write it, how does that vary with changing the chemical potential? Right? Is the notation clear enough? I mean, hidden in this notation is the equilibrium ensemble, which depends on the chemical potential mu. Right? So I can ask, how does it depend? I just, I don't know why I tried to make a decorated delta, really, because, uh, okay. So just take the derivative, right? Just a derivative, partial derivative with respect to delta. Now, since we know the stationary distribution, we don't need miracles. We can just compute it, right? And you know the answer, I think. And the answer is that if I'm looking at the change in uh, chemical potential, then um, actually, uh, you know the answer, but I don't know the answer. It is basically um, uh, the variance, no? So let me write the variance of the number of part of the of the of this random variable in the equilibrium ensemble, and maybe there is a factor of one half or so around. I don't remember, um, but I can replace it with something more complicated. I see. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it is one half or not. Maybe somebody knows. Let me put one half. I don't know. We will check in a moment. But this is a remarkable formula because it, if the variance, how this fluctuates, the spread in this n, in the number of particles in equilibrium, gives you information about its sensitivity to the chemical potential. That's an example in equilibrium of what is called a fluctuation relation. Right? Because it is the spreading in the quantity which is related to a response quantity. You know this also from uh, heat, specific heat, right? Which is related to the spreading in the, in the energy, right? So the variance in the energy gives rise to specific heat. Here you have that the spreading in the, in the, in the number of particles gives rise to the response of the number of particles to the mobility. Actually, let me write a more complicated formula, which I will... Um, used to correct this one, I hope. Namely, you see, even though I have not been speaking about the dynamics, I can ask in equilibrium, so here I will write equilibrium, at time t, how the number of particles has changed with respect to the equilibrium that I started with at chemical potential mu. So this is t after time zero, where I had chemical potential mu. Do you understand? So I started in equilibrium with potential mu, and then I change at time zero the chemical potential to mu plus delta, and I ask what's the number of particles at time t, and how does it compare with, you know, the equilibrium? Well, there is a formula for that, and we will derive this, all of that in lecture two, and it is, now I know what it is, it's one half the number of particles at time t, uh, sorry, I write this as nt, that's fine, minus the number of particles at time zero, squared, mu, and that is a first order equation, so it means that this is of order delta beta. Okay, this is called a Kubo relation related to what I said, like a fluctuation or a fluctuation dissipation relation. So the change in chemical, the change in number of particles when you change the chemical potential is given by basically a spreading. Now people will maybe recognize something similar to a diffusion constant, right? It looks a bit like it's not a diffusion constant, but it's like how is the spreading in time going, right? And that is multiplied with beta. Beta is one over kT, by the way. And it is in linear response, it means there will be corrections of order delta squared. So I'm looking very close to equilibrium. How does that go? That's a linear response formula, which we will discuss in lecture two. So obviously, I can take the limit as t goes to infinity, 
And then I would get my formula that I didn't know how to write, right? I just take the limit of t going to infinity, and then I have equilibrium in mu plus delta minus equilibrium in mu. I just take the limit of t going to infinity of that thing. So far, so good. So that's called the Kubo formula. Maybe I will add uh, this Kubo here. And uh, that finishes the equilibrium part. So I have half hour to now do all my promises of non-equilibrium. But I wrote these names here not so much because, well, not so much as noners, but to add a final remark to equilibrium. Maybe it was not on the left-hand side here. Well, the dynamics is an equilibrium dynamics, but it's not equilibrium at time t. Thank you. So the notation is a bit strange, no? So um, this, so I should write here rather an equilibrium dynamics. So this, okay. So. Right, so the right hand side is the reference equilibrium. Yes. <laughs> Lecture two will happily be in a better notation. Are there still questions about all these formulas before I conclude the equilibrium session with a remark? So the equilibrium session will be closed by the following remark. You see something extraordinary is true in equilibrium. There is the letter S, no? Which is called entropy. And entropy has a lot of friends, but these friends are just the same by Legendre transform. They are, you know, free energies, grand canonical free energies. They're all related. These are the thermodynamic potentials. And somehow the entropy is the first one, like Kronos giving rise to all these children. But they started by closures to be related to heat. No, entropy is basically related to specific heat and the changes of heat in the reservoir. That's how star entropy started. But the same entropy is related to probabilities. That's Boltzmann's formula, which is already a very strange thing, namely how this closures relation, which remember is like the reversible heat divided by temperature, how this closures entropy is related to probabilities is related to forces. You know, this was this remark one, basically. Entropy gives rise to really forces. It's, it gives rise to thermodynamic forces. And at the same time, this entropy will enter in response theory to see the dissipation, because I did not make this very specific here. But clearly, what is happening is in the spreading of this you know, this diffusive behavior of this particle number, there is also a dissipative aspect related to entropy, which will be more explicit um, tomorrow. Now, given that somehow all of this forces, responses, uh, Lyapunov, the H theorem, you know, the H theorem of Boltzmann is also referring to the same entropy, all of that is centered around this entropy, you cannot expect this to be so happily true in non-equilibrium. Right? If a non-equilibrium is to be strange, complex, difficult, and also very rich, it is basically because this river, uh, which is the same river in the valley of Clausius, Boltzmann, Onsager, and Kubo, that it will split in many different types of little streams, which are not necessarily related to entropy anymore, but where non-thermodynamic information will be important. All right? So if we now speak about non-equilibrium, Basically, it means all of the blackboard will remain, well, will, will become untrue, has to be adapted. It will not longer be governed by entropy. It will no longer be governed by detailed balance or by pure thermodynamic reasoning to govern the large deviations, etc. So that's a way of saying what is non-equilibrium. It's like this breaking of these aspects of thermodynamics, of detailed balance, of time reversal invariance, etc. Okay, so let me then, in the last half hour, do my promises and show you for this model how we can still understand the direction of the current and so on, all right?
So now we want to give it a non-equilibrium um, description. And the thing that we want to model is now that we have our lattice interval with our particles, you remember? Exclusion with some energy. We would like to say that they are also subject to reservoirs which are now at different chemical potentials. So I will write here mu L for a chemical potential to the left and the mu right, mu R, for a chemical potential to the right. Now, the question is, what is a good physical model? I mean, we can write many, I mean, if you go to non-equilibrium maybe, or to whatever branch, you can write many, many different types of models, but what's a good model? And somehow the guideline for making a good model is written here. You know, this was detailed balance, but I wrote it in terms of the change in entropy in the reservoir. Now, this detailed balance, we will now change into what we call local detailed balance. Okay, so now the model will satisfy a local detailed balance condition. Let me first say it in words briefly what it means. So I was saying that there will be particles hopping in and out of the system into the left reservoir. It's not such a strange thing in classical physics or even in quantum when you're not speaking about entangled reservoirs to assume that the rates at which this is hopping is going on is just satisfying the same detailed balance as before. I mean, I mean to say it uh, a bit uh, popular, whatever happens here in these exchanges why would they know what is the chemical potential to the right, no? These are local things. This is, ex I mean, this, this physics there is local, related to the local energies and particle numbers and chemical potential, and wouldn't care what is far away on a micro, on a mesoscopic scale, the other chemical potential. In other words, what we will do is we keep the same condition, but of course we will have to change the specific meaning of this change of entropy. So what is this change of entropy now? So we keep the condition that this ratio is equal to an exponential of a change of entropy in the reservoir per Kb. But now this change of entropy, I do not write the delta anymore if you do not mind. I mean, just S as the change of entropy, I, I, I hope you understand, that is like a flux. That will be 1 over the temperature E of eta minus E of eta prime minus mu left divided by temperature, the left number of particles minus mu r over temperature, the number of particles in the right reservoir. What is that? Okay, so I introduced simply a new notation, which is a bit dangerous because what do I know about the number of particles in the left reservoir, right? But clearly what I'm interested in is in the change of number of particles in the left reservoir and the change of particles in the right reservoir. Mind you, this eta to eta prime, this will be an elementary transition. So it will be a transition related to, I mean, I didn't even specify the dynamics, but if I have that eta prime is just a local bulk change, then of course this will be zero. It will only matter, these last terms will only matter if particles leave the system, right? Now, as I said, I do not know much about this left reservoir, but of course I can express that this change in the number of particles in the left reservoir, I can express this in terms of currents. Right? This change to the left is clearly related to a current that is happening. And here, if it is, if, if it is one particle by one particle, that can be plus one, minus one, or zero. So in that way, I think of a current which is happening here and a current which is happening here into the left and the right reservoir. But now the next step in our thought will be that these currents will, of course, be related to bulk currents in the steady state, right? Because the average number of particles cannot change 
in the system. So it must be related to the average number of particles leaving the system. And you get a relation between bulk currents and boundary currents. That's also the type of tricks which are involved here. Okay, but so the, what I have been doing now is just tell you that our model with local detail balance amounts to saying that the rates of changes, even before we know the specific dynamics in detail, it will be a Markov process with transition rates k, and they have to satisfy e minus beta e of eta prime minus e of eta. That is the change in energy, and then minus mu L beta, J L eta eta prime, minus mu R beta, J R eta eta prime, where I have defined you already what I mean by the left and the right outgoing current, right? This left and right outgoing currents, they are plus or minus one or zero, depending on whether a particle enters or leaves the reservoir or nothing happens, okay? So this will only, this energy will always change. Also, when there is something in the bulk happening, this will only matter when it is at the boundary that something is changing. Okay, so just to remind you what I also said, that if I take the left current from eta to eta prime, plus the right current from eta to eta prime, this will be the change of the particle number in the, in the universe, in the world, right? By definition. Good. Now, if you see these things, these relations, and I, I mean, this is like another two-line computation, this will lead to the fact that this ratio of forward and backward transition rates can be written as follows. It can be written as the probability in equilibrium for the grand canonical ensemble of having eta prime divided by the probability in equilibrium for having mu beta of eta times an exponential minus epsilon just the JL, where epsilon is just here defined a distance to equilibrium. So I take epsilon so that the mu L is equal to mu plus epsilon and the mu right is equal to mu. Okay, some explanations with these formulas. So I almost completely did the computation which has been leading to this equality. But let me still explain what is in it. So the main input to arrive at such an equality is a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is the one of local detail balance which basically amounts to time reversal invariance principle, which I apply locally at the boundaries. The rest is basically a computation where I find that the ratio of transition rates is like the ratio of probabilities in equilibrium, but not just like that. It's multiplied with an exponential of minus epsilon, the current of particles into the left reservoir, where epsilon is a measure of non-equilibrium, Namely, it gives the difference between the chemical potential left and right. So I have parameterized them by this number epsilon. It can be a large number, a small number. My arguments will not be perturbative today. So it will be possible that this epsilon is of order one. Okay, are there questions here? Oh, the mic, where is the micro, are you? <laughs> no, if I want to do a uh, Monte Carlo simulation, Yes. Uh, what dynamics I should do? Okay. okay, yes, good, thank you. Um, so basically, you can do any dynamics which is compatible with this one. But maybe you want an example. So let me give you an example. Actually, um, okay, I have to give you an example. So I will take the rate of going from eta to eta prime. Uh, I will do it in two steps. First of all, I will write you some uh, something which is like, okay, these are long formulas, but let me nevertheless do them. Um, Uh, 
Um, okay, let me start again, uh, because this will be too long. I will just give you an example. Maybe I have even an example with me. Yes, I have. So, um, so first of all, when the eta prime is exchange of occupations over a bolt over of a bond, then I will use this formula. Is that making sense? So I mean, so I, you take an eta, you have an eta, and now you pick a random bond, you pick a random bond, and you look what is the occupation on the two sides of the bond, then uh, the eta prime is the exchange. So in other words, uh, if you take a bond and here is a one zero, then you go to this zero one with such a rate and you compute the difference in energy. Okay, of course, if it is like one one, you go to one one and you will find that the energy is the same. Anyway, you don't need to do that even. These are rates that is not important. Now, there is of course another way of saying that instead of exchanging the configuration, you can look at hopping of particles and then you can only hop to a site where there is no particle. But I, I somehow I if avoid this exclusion principle by speaking about exchanges. But the cost that I have to pay is that I also seem to exchange one one with one one, which is not very pleasant. So I don't do anything when they have the same configuration. Right? So this is when you do things in the bulk. So that means that if I have my one to L, I have my bond here, I have particles which jump to the right. This is empty, so I will have like that. And it will be obtained that rate by looking at the change in energy. Or I can have a particle and here nothing, and it can go like that. And it will again be given by the same rate. So there is a symmetry left, right in the bulk. There is no bias to go to the right or to the left. It's just governed by energy. And it is given by looking at the change in energy. If beta would be equal to zero, that would always be one. So you get a rate to go to the right of one and to the left of one, given the fact that it is empty where you go to. And of course, you must be a particle yourself. So that's for the bulk. Then I have to tell you how these things, what are the rates to go to the, to the bond, to, to, to leave the system. So if I have a particle, say here, sitting at the, at, the, at the edge, the left edge, it can leave the system at a certain rate. And it can leave the system because then eta prime is different in zero. It will become zero while eta prime, while eta at zero was equal to one. Right? All the rest of the configuration remains the same. It's just that at this side, you go from a one to a zero. So what is the rate that I will choose here? I will choose as a rate E minus beta mu left. That is the rate I will choose. Mert also multiplied with this yellow thing that I will not repeat here. I always have to take into account energy changes also. But you see that if mu L would be very large, so you have a very big chemical potential to the left, it will rarely happen, right? That I go like that because beta is the inverse temperature, so it will rarely happen. Same thing happens to the right. So if I have a particle sitting here and I want to go to the right, this will happen in the same way with a rate which is E minus beta mu R. Again, multiplied with this change, change in energy. Okay. Now, the opposite I have still to tell you. Namely, it can happen that you also have a vacancy here and that a particle is entering from the right reservoir. And that will have, except for this yellow formula, which is always there, I will have, I will just put equal to one, the rate. Okay. And the same thing, of course, if I uh, add a particle from the left reservoir, I just take a rate to be one. Okay, so that is a complete description. But note the following that, well, note two things. 
First of all, note that um, this example, as I have described it, is compatible with, with this. That's the first thing I want to tell you. Maybe it takes maybe more than one minute to check it, really, but you have to take this. You know, there is a reason why I put a two here. Right? And the reason why I put no two here is because I put a one. Right? But, so that's the first remark. So this example is just one example which satisfies this thing here. Okay? But secondly, you have to understand that there are many other examples which will satisfy it. Because I could have chosen here instead of this e minus beta mu L of, I could have chosen divide by two. And here then I would have to write e to the uh, beta mu L over two. Right? I can play with these things. The only thing what matters is that the ratio of this divided by that gives you a beta mu L. That's the only thing that matters. So that's an important lesson uh, that we'll get here. You know, I was trying not to speak about what Anupam was asking me. I was trying to not speak about that, and I thought of this as being forceful not to speak about that. Why? Because all I will do, all these results that I may want to reach in 10 minutes, they will not depend on what you do in detail. So, in other words, it will only depend on the ratio of the case. Local detail balance is the only thing that is needed at least to answer the question why the direction of the current is correct and what's the fluctuation of an error. The response, that's a different issue, but the first question about the direction of the current and the fluctuation of an error will only depend on local detail balance. That's why I was avoiding your question. But it was a nice question to have it, of course, more specifically. Right? So this is a specific way of implementing a dynamics which satisfies local detail balance. But you know, a rate, I'm sorry to repeat this, a transition rate to go from eta to eta prime is more than just the ratio. Right? There is also the time symmetric aspect, the activation somehow, which I did not discuss so far. And I didn't want to discuss it. All right? So let us know. Is it sufficient on this thing? OK. Good. So that was an example. I will erase it. But it's important indeed to be specific about these rates. OK. Now, there is one ingredient that I still need to introduce because now I want to speak about uh, the direction and the error. That is the last chapter. I hope I can at least do something still. But there is, however, one ingredient that I have to add now. You know, if we speak about the current, that is some dynamical observable, right? That gives you not just a static at a certain time that you look, you have to watch the trajectory to understand the current. So what we really need to discuss these things, naturally, we need the probability of trajectories. And the trajectory is just defined by some time window, 0 to t. We take this window in time, and we look at all the jumps that happen in our system, in, out, in the bulk, all of these changes. And then it will give us a probability of an omega. Omega is my abbreviation for the, for the, the trajectory. So, so I hope omega is clear. What is omega? Omega is basically a sequence of, time, of, of configurations where the time runs between 0 and t. So you have these configurations in time. You have your simulation running, your Markov process running in time. And I just look at it starting in the steady state. And I look at it for a certain time. I didn't mention something about the stationary distribution here. But there is a unique stationary distribution, which we don't know. 
So there is this Markov process. It satisfies a master equation. And you know what is a master equation. Um, you have a stationary master equation. So there is a stationary distribution. But we don't know it. And I chose my energy so that surely you don't know it. So that's the game that we want to play. We don't know the stationary distribution, and yet we want to know the direction of the current, etc. So the nice thing is that we can go to the probability of trajectories. And a trajectory is like that. OK? So given that this omega is on the blackboard, let me also define the time-reversed trajectory. So I take a trajectory. You can imagine it in your head, a trajectory of particles hopping and leaving and entering. And now I just time reverse it. So it means that this new, this new trajectory, it's also compatible with the dynamics. It's an allowed trajectory. But at time s, it is equal to the previous one at time t minus s. That's the definition. So that's the trajectory, uh, the original one. And that's the time reverse trajectory. So you just reverse, well, whatever was at the end is now the beginning. OK? Time reverse trajectory. Now, suppose. Suppose, for a moment, that the probability of a trajectory divided by the probability of theta omega, suppose for a moment that we know that thing. Suppose it is equal to, I, will, I need a letter. So I will write it like the exponential of, um, you want a letter. So what is a letter? Uh, it's a certain function of omega. Let me call it z of o well, z is like a partition function. Um, why don't I call it um, uh, which one? Why? 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 Why of omega? Okay. Suppose I'm able to do that. Suppose I know this y. So I take you know this. You should think of this ratio as very similar to that. This is also a ratio. Now, I think you can imagine that since I know this, I know this, right? So in fact, this y I will know exactly. And you can already imagine that this y will be exactly related to this current. Can you? No, this is a ratio of transition rates. And what is the probability of a trajectory? It's basically a product of transition rates, right? So you can easily imagine, but let me not do that by lack of time for the moment. Let me tell you that we know this y. And let me just write this. But you know, um, something is true about this thing, no? Like, suppose I sum over all trajectories. No complaints, OK? So then I continue, and I take the probability of uh, um, uh, omega, I guess, times the probability of theta omega divided by the probability of omega. That seems to be 1, right? Because I just can cancel these two probabilities, and I just get the sum of the probability of theta omega. Theta is an involution. Right? Theta squared is equal to 1, right? Is the identity. So that is equal to 1. Now, if you don't like that I sum over omega, you can take uh, an integral and do something more complex. It's really a path integral, right? Because I have a continuum of trajectories. But let me just for the sake, you know, we're all friends here. So let me just take the sum over omega, just to make it clear what I'm doing. So that's equal to 1 by normalization. So that clearly means that if I take the average of e, um, no, not, not yet average. So, so that clearly means, so, so that, re, that implies that I have the sum of omega, probability omega, of exponential of um, the logarithm of the probability of theta omega divided by p of omega. That is still 1. I'm sorry, I'm doing something very stupid, I take the exponential of the logarithm. But there is a reason to do that, because the logarithm of this thing, that is just minus y. Right? So I find that the expectation of e minus y is equal to 1. Don't I? 
just directly from here. I repeat, it's very simple. This is a definition, if you wish, that gives me y. So I take the probability, that's just a normalization. I write this probability basically as e minus y. I mean, that's all what I'm doing. So I get that the exponential of e minus y is, is equal to 1. But note there is a general inequality in, uh, in mathematics. It's called Jensen inequality, which is an expression of convexity, which says that such exponentials are, in fact, larger than e minus y. That's convexity. So that immediately implies that if uh, one is larger than this, it means that this y has to be negative, if I'm not mistaken. No, or positive. Uh, positive, I guess. Right? So in other words, do you follow? I mean, this is like a four-line calculation, a very abstract or general nonsense. It tells you that from the moment you have that is true, then you know that its expectation is positive by just mathematics of convexity. So when we have that, we immediately have that. I told you this y we can calculate from this equality. I didn't do this calculation, but I will do it tomorrow in lecture two to, to make sure you understand this calculation. But you can already see it happening. You can see that indeed what you will find is that this y is nothing else than a current. And what you will express is the positivity of the entropy production, really. And you will express the second law of thermodynamics which will give you that the current flows in the right direction. Okay, so these last arguments I do not give in detail. It will be for tomorrow. I don't want to rush too much the things here, but I hope that at least the logic is kind of clear. I only use local detail balance, only use local detail balance, and that will allow me, that will allow me a physical characterization of this Y. And that physical characterization, whatever it is, and it must be related to entropy production or current, give me a general relation, which is positivity. In fact, in fact, it is a strict inequality, because we also know from Jensen that whenever this y has fluctuations, this must be, in fact, strictly true. Okay? So whenever the mu l is different from mu r, whenever the epsilon will be strictly positive, it will mean that there will be a current flowing from left to right. That is what this basic inequality is. You see, I mean, uh, despite uh, the very many formulas that have appeared today on the blackboard, I only used one thing, which is detailed balance, which I implemented in a local way to arrive at that. And once I have that, I get general things, which give me very strong results about the nature of this current. But if, can I still, uh, just to, to have this probability of an error, no? Because this calculation also immediately will give us the, the probability of an error. Because look, so I will come back to that in greater detail in, uh, in lecture three, actually. Look here. Here I said that this is equal to one. This is very true. But let me say something which is even stronger. You see, here I said that e minus y is equal to 1. But um, let me try to compute the probability that this capital Y is equal to some small y. So this is a function of omega. What's the probability that it is equal to some small y? Well, clearly, this is the sum over all the omega, the probability of omega. But such omega, so that y omega is equal to y, right? So now let me divide this by the probability of theta omega and multiply with the probability of theta omega. I could do, I can do that, no? This is nothing multiplying and... But this ratio of probability of omega divided by probability theta omega is exactly e to the power y from here. So what do I get? Since y is equal to y, I get e to the power small y times the sum over all the omega, y of omega equal to y times the probability of theta omega. 
All right? So it's not surprising that I get as a conclusion, you see this last thing here, that's basically the probability that y is equal to minus y, right? Because I'm looking at the theta of it. And I assume that the y, as it is, anti-symmetric under time reversal. So the conclusion is of this fast thing, and apologies for so being so fast, you get that the probability of y divided by the probability of minus y is equal to the exponential of y. So you can imagine now that this y is again a current, the probability of a current to go in the right direction divided by the probability of going in the wrong direction is exponential of the value of that current. So the higher is the current, the more away from equilibrium you are, the less likely it will be, and it will be in an exponential way. Okay, I will repeat these arguments in lecture three and be more specific about the calculation. And clearly, there is a calculation that I was hiding for, well, not hiding, I didn't do, namely how you go from the K, the transition rates, how you go to the Y, right? And that is the subject of characterizing the dynamical ensemble. Because if you look at it from a distance, what I have been doing is the following. I don't know the stationary distribution. In equilibrium, I know it. I can do explicit calculation in large deviation response. It's all explicit. Here, I don't know it. So what I do, I go one dimension higher. I go to what is called dynamical ensembles. I look at the probabilities of trajectories instead of probabilities of equal time configurations. And if I go to probability of trajectories, I can use my information about rates. Rates determine the probability of trajectories. And when I am on that level of probability of trajectories, things are again explicit. And I can use the same ideas in equilibrium statistical mechanics, but now on the level of trajectories. So it's like instead of a Hamiltonian approach, I'm going to a Lagrangian approach to treat non-equilibrium. Okay, with this kind of strange message, I think I, it's time certainly to stop. And so the promise is that more and more explicit things hopefully will come um, in the following lectures. So thank you.